Okay, so the way we're going to do this is we're going to create an example program. I'm going to walk through how you create channels and send to them. And then we'll work on, that's essentially going to be the first program, and then we'll work on the second. Okay. Um, so to do that, I'm going to move all these. In here, day four, I'm going to create a folder, channel, example, and make an app YAML because this is a app engine pro project. And so every app engine project has to have an app YAML. Uh, and it requires these four things. So this is your application ID in App Engine, and these are just the pre canned values. And we have handlers, and we can see the format of a handler here is URL. I just want everything to go to Go, so I say script Go app. I don't care about login right now, so I'm just going to take that. Okay, so we have our app YAML, so that means we can start a server. Whatever's running here. So I am in that folder, going book, boot, boot camp examples, week three, day four channel example. This is on GitHub. So you could go to this URL. Um, I haven't uploaded it yet, but that's where it'll be when we do. Uh, so we create a four channel example, uh, and so I can say go app, and then serve, and that will start the app engine server, and I can go to localhost8080. That makes sense. Go application could not be built because there's no go files. So we have to create a go file. package main, because every Go file must have a package at the top. Or maybe we, just to show it different, we can change this to channel. Okay. Doesn't matter. Um, then we have a func init. And this function gets run anytime uh, this, this Go code is run. It's the first thing that gets run. And then what we want to do is we want to make some HTTP routes. So we'll import that HTTP. I'm just going to make a route for slash create underscore channel. Okay. And I want to give it a function. So I'm going to say handle func. So that's the HTTP package and a function inside there, um, which we can see docs for by doing go doc net slash HTTP handle. See, it's described here, pattern and handler. So we'll just take that, create a function, with func, and then the name. And I will call this handle create channel. And then give names to my parameters. And then I'm going to pass it into route here. Okay. And so now if I go to this URL, localhost colon 8080 slash create channel, it'll go to this function and do what I tell it to do. So we're just going to write So all I'm going to do is write hello world if you go to that URL. So cool, that's working. So I went to slash create channel. It's running my Go code, and the Go app sort of automatically rebuilds my project, so I don't have to go build it, but it's doing that for me. And this is building a routing table. So, so it's saying map for create channel route to this function. So when I go to create channel, it goes to this function, and then I run my code. Okay. 
So what we want to do is create a channel. So how are we going to do that? Well, we can go look up the API for channels, and it's app engine slash channel. So package channel, package channel implements the server side of app engine's channel API, and then it tells you that create creates a new channel associated with the client ID, which must be unique to the client that will use the return token. Now this is something we invent. We can make up whatever this ID is, and you can see here in the function call, it takes in, what do you, let's see? Context. A context, because everything takes the context. And the second thing is the ID, the thing we want to call it. And we can name it whatever we want. So an example of the kind of thing you might want to use is the person's email address, something unique to that person, right? Um, but you could use anything you want. But the reason why that is, is a channel is a one, it's, it's one connection. You cannot, uh, they say this explicitly, you cannot have multiple people listening on the same channel. Okay? So it's like a phone call, not like a television station. So you can have one person on the other end of the phone call. You're not broadcasting like a TV station where everybody can be on the same channel. So this has to be unique per person. Um, so we'll, we'll just make something up for now. But, so I say channel dot, and let me uh, import that. So I just take this URL up here. Google, golang.org slash app engine slash channel. And then I use that here. So it has create, send, and send JSON. I will use create. Since the channel has to be unique for, you know, it's like a phone call, would, would we use something associated with the user that we're sending or making the channel with? So, like, if I want to do a channel with Nick, you know, I just say, put his username if that's the name of this channel. And that way, it would, you know, every time I go through code, if I did initiate 10 channels, well, that would be Nick, this would be Daniel, that would write the ID for the channel. It has to be unique or the... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the idea is that, uh, I mean, it depends on what you're using them for. Um, and we'll see with the chat application one usage, but uh, usually you're not going to have the JavaScript <coughs> send the channel ID explicitly. Okay. Or if you do the channel ID, in other words, you're probably not going to say, like, send, give it an email address and a message. Because that seems a little too much. You could put any email address in there, and maybe you don't want that capability. But you could, I mean, maybe for a chat application, that's okay. Okay. It just means you could send anybody a message, right? In other words, their, their channel ID is easy to guess. And maybe you don't want it to be easy to guess. Yeah. And so if you don't want it to be easy to guess, you can either use, uh, remember we use the hash function? Yeah. Uh, we could use that. In other words, take an email and turn it into a different string and use that string. Or we could use memcache. Stuff the email in the memcache with the ID, and then use the ID, and then we can do the reverse operation when you try to send. So I send, you know, I say, oh, uh, you know, uh, testedexample.com is ID 103, and then people who want to message testedexample.com, they message 103. But they don't know what other numbers might be. So. Yeah. Any, anyway, we'll see examples. All right, cool. We're just going to create one channel now, though. So uh, we use channel create. It takes a context, so we got to create a context first. And so most of the examples you see, obviously, is the CTX, uh, just because that looks like context to me. Um, so we say colon equal because it's a new variable, and we say app engine, and that's our package dot new context. And new context takes an HTTP request, which we have as rec. And that will give us some context. So the second thing create takes is the ID. So we're just going to call this example. Um, but like I said, you, you want to be better about naming it probably. Um, and then if we go look at the docs,
create, takes in the context and the client ID, returns a token and an error. So since it returns a token and an error, I have to put those over here. And then uh, I probably want to check my error. So if error is not nil, and then we're going to use the standard HTTP error, hand it the response. I get the error message by saying error.error. .error. And then a code, which I'm just going to do 500. And then return. That way, I don't keep going. So if I'm unable to create a channel, perhaps I've reached the quota on my account of how many channels I can create. Um, I just want to have an error. OK, so this gives me back a token. So at this point, let's just see what that token is. So I'm going to do io.writeString and the response and the token. So get rid of that. And, OK. Um, so let's see what we get. We get a really big token. If I refresh, it's like recreating. Okay. Um, so this is the channel ID. I get this huge token. Um, and that's what you hand back. And using that token, the JavaScript side can connect to the Google server and receive messages that are sent on this channel. So when I, if, I, uh, if I send, let's see that. Um, then if you're listening on this token, you can receive it. So this is kind of like the session ID. Uh, so there is a channel out there, and the token allows me to connect to it. Okay. It's like a, a password that the server has handed to me that if you use that password, they'll let you in. Okay. Um, because otherwise, you can just connect to the server and say, oh yeah, I want to I wanna connect to testedexample.com's channel. Right? And you don't want people to be able to do that. Connect to anybody's channel. It'd be like if you could just connect to anybody's phone and receive all the phone calls. That's not cool. So um, we use a token to identify who you're allowed to connect to. Um, okay, so we have a channel. Uh, we would like to listen. So let's create another handler to listen on the channel. So I'm just going to make a slash listen, and then I'm going to do a function called handle listen, and we'll add him down here. Take him a response writer and the request. <clears throat> and what I want to do here is I'm going to write some HTML, okay? Because this is JavaScript. The listening is done by JavaScript, not by Go, right? Remember in the diagram, it's the laptop who's listening for messages, not the server. So this has to be done by JavaScript, so I'm going to write that. Um, to the server. So we have our basic scaffold here. We're going to have a script in here that's going to do JavaScript stuff. Um, so one of the reasons why I, I, I tend to like to use separate files is because this is Go. Here's a string. Inside the string is HTML. Inside the HTML is JavaScript. We're, <laughs> we'll just keep going layers and layers down. So it's nice to have these as separate files because then I can like when I'm looking at an HTML file, I can think, I'm in HTML. And then when I see a script, I can say, I'm going to go to the JavaScript file. And you're not all in the same file. Okay. Thanks. Um, and so, but for our example, we don't have to do that because it's going to be pretty small. Um, so now we're going to want to, so I'm going to put in a comment here. I want to connect, to listen on the channel. Okay. So the problem is, how do we do that? Well, we know we're going to need that token. Okay. So rather than hook it up so it gets the token, I'm going to make us manually give it the token. So I'm going to say prompt. I think it's prompt, isn't it? I think it's. I, I have. 
haven't used these things for years. So, uh, so if you use prompt in JavaScript, it will ask you for things, and you give it something, and it returns that. So that's kind of handy. Do you ever recall that? Yeah. I said the pr function prompt, and it's a string you give it to what shows up in the little dialog, and then it returns whatever the user enters in. Um, you basically never use this on no websites because the user flow is so bad. Like it pops up that dialog, locks up the whole browser. You know, people don't know what to do with that. So, but it's useful for examples. Um, so I'm going to say enter your token. The other reason it's useful for examples is it does something you cannot do in JavaScript normally. This waits until they enter something, and then it's available right away. And normally in JavaScript, you have to do that with a callback because waiting is bad. So, um, anyway, so we get our token, and now we need to listen. So how do we do that? Well, let's just make sure this is working by just trying out what people enter. So I'm going to just alert whatever the person enters. So if I go to slash listen, I should hit this function and it should dump out this HTML. I like how you're putting this together. This is a nice example. Enter your token. You entered text. Okay. They're so mad they put this little, just stop telling me that. Okay. Well, the reason, the reason why they put that in is so it can't pop up, up a thousand yeah. of them. I know, I just say that, that the user flow is so bad that they've had to add things to like, because <laughs> you're right, you can have a site that just keeps popping, alert, 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 and you wouldn't be able to do it in your browser. You do your task manager and kill it. I mean, so that's why they've done that. But, uh, it's just funny. Okay, so you enter and then the token. So we need to get the token. Like I said, we're just going to do that manually. So I'm just, you know, for the real example here, I'm just going to copy that and paste it in here. And we'll do something. Um, so what do we want to do with it? Well, if we go to the documentation for the channel API, uh, this is interesting because normally, you know, if you look at these, there's an overview reference. The overview describes the system, and that's kind of what I did with the diagram in the first part, is to describe what channels are for. Um, and then reference tells you how to use them in Go, because this is the Go docs, right? We're in Go. And so you can see uh, how to use them. But this one's unusual and that has a client JavaScript reference. And that's because channels are for JavaScript. And so they have also have documentation for how to use JavaScript to do it, because that's the other side of the channel. Uh, and so the first thing we have to do is include this script. Okay? So this script, this special underscore AH channel JS API, this is a special route that the app engine will handle for us. And when you see the underscore AH at the beginning, that usually means that this is a special built-in app engine capability. And this will give us a function we can call JavaScript uh, to connect to the channel. So let's grab that and put it in the head of our page. So now we're including a script on our page. So let's see what that gives us. Um, so if I want to see what's available, I can say window. Dot. Uh, and this can be a little challenging to find things. There is on here a, a Goog, G-O-O-G. So if I do that. G-O-O-G. Window.G-O-O-G. So a lot of Google uh, libraries written in JavaScript are like that. And then it has an app engine. And app engine has channel and socket. So the way this works, and they have the example in here, is you use it like this. So you say new google.appengine.channel and give it the token. So now we're getting somewhere. We have our token right here, right? I got it right here. And so now instead of saying alert, I can say channel equal new and give it a token. And let's see what that gives us. I'm going to change this to console. <laughs> Just because that's cleaner. Okay, so I ask for the token, I enter the token, then I say create a new channel, and now I'm going to look and see what the channel is when I do that. Okay, so create a token, 
copy the token, listen, enter the token. So now it created this thing, which is a g underscore g dot a underscore e dot dev channel. <laughs> kind of crazy data space is that. Uh, but anyway, it created a channel, okay? And this is a JavaScript object. And if we look at their docs, um, we just call open and a handler. So it says opens a socket on this channel. So that's very much like with the XML HTTP request. We create a new one and then we say dot open. This is very much the same, we're gonna say on uh, open. So that's gonna give you a socket and then you can set callback properties directly on the return socket object or set them using the optional object handler with the following properties. And what that's saying is there's sort of two ways you can do this. Um, so I have channel dot open. I could call it like this and that's gonna give me a socket. Okay, and then I can say socket dot, and then there's these four callbacks. So let's just say on open equal function. Um, so we could do it this way, or so this, or this. You can say channel dot open and give it an object and say on open. And that'll do the same thing, okay? Um, so up to you, whatever style you like better. I mean, I think this is probably a little cleaner, so we'll go with that. Um, so I'll just comment this out. But everybody understand the difference? But that's just JavaScript, right? That's what they're telling you. That's the optional handler. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do is add a bunch of console logs. So this is open and see what it gives me. Actually, the easiest way to do that is to use arguments. And that will show you whatever was passed in. So let's we'll take that out. And then we can do that for the others. So I'm going to copy on open. And there's on message, on error, and on close. So we'll have on message. Change this to message. And then on error. Error and then on close, it changes to close. Okay. And notice that I took out that last comma. There was a comma right here. Yeah. Because in JavaScript, you can't have a trailing comma. In Go, you not only can, you must have a trailing comma. So it's a little different. Okay. So now we have created a socket. We created a channel by giving it a token. I give it to a channel. And then we said channel.open to give us a socket. And the socket, we gave all these uh, callback functions. And just so, just to note, this is almost identical to what a WebSocket looks like. Okay. You'd say new WebSocket. It's very simple. Um, but the basic idea is that these callbacks will be called based on the state of the socket. Uh, so I should get on open, and then the first time I get a message, on message should be called. And then if the socket is closed, maybe I get disconnected from the internet or something, uh, this should be called. So let's see what happens. Um, so I'll create a channel, listen, give it the token. Now I have, see open got called? Uh, that's a little bit of So oh, the open callback got called, and that's it. All that happened was open. And it didn't, it didn't pass anything, which is interesting, uh, because there's just like really nothing to pass. It just means your channel's open, right? And so now he's sitting there waiting. My, my client is sitting there waiting for something to come through. And it is doing so using polling. So, like I said, this is an abstraction. Um, and I, I think the server probably does something better than this. But <laughs> you can see it happening, right? It's just making requests over and over and over again to see if there's a new message. Lots of requests, and they all take five milliseconds. That's very fast. Um, so let's send it something. So now we have, we've created the channel, and now we have a JavaScript thing listening on the channel, and now we want to send it something, okay? So that is done by GoCode. So what I'm going to do is create another handler called slash send, and we'll have handle send. And the idea here is that these are going to be all the 
same. This time, we want the send to take in a message and send it to the channel that we created. Okay? So we want to send a message to a channel. Notice we send it not to the token, but to the channel ID. So the JavaScript listener listens based on that token, but we send based on the channel ID. So there's that connection between the two. Um, and so the way we do that is, well, first we have to get what we want to send. So I'm just going to use form value. Okay, rec.formValue. And remember that form value can get things out of a post form or from the URL. So if I go to slash send question mark, and this is where we give it the name, let's call it message, um, question mark message equal, then it will get that out of the URL. Okay. But if I post it and had this as part of a form, that would work too. So it'll work for either. Question. Yeah. So the, um, the client is listening, or you know, you needs to use the token which you create on line 24, and then you give that token to the client because down below you have your JavaScript right there on the, on the Go thing. Um, if your JavaScript was in a different file, just a JS file, it's almost like your JavaScript needs to be in a Go file, right? No, 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 because remember, I took the token based on what they entered it, which is um, I'll admittedly very hacky. Yeah. But, uh, so actually I could have pulled this to a separate file, it wouldn't matter. Now normally what you would do to get the token is you would make a separate call to another endpoint on the server slash API slash create channel or something. Okay. Or slash whatever. Okay, so the client would be able to grab the token through Ajax or something. Yeah, exactly. Now you might also put okay. it in the page. I might, you know, do okay. uh, backtick plus and give it a token. Okay, yeah. Uh, that's also not that unusual. Got it. Makes sense. Okay. So we're going to have a message and now come in and send. And now we want to send it. Uh, and so we look at the channel API. And it has send and send JSON. Uh, we want to use send JSON just, just for this example. Uh, and usually we want to use send JSON. That just means it's going to send it as a JSON object. It's going to do the encoding for you and all that. Um, so we use send JSON. It takes the context, the client ID, and the value. We'll make the context in a second. What's the client ID? Is that the token? No. It's example. Example. This, these two men. And value. Well, what's value? Uh, some sort of a data structure that you want to turn into yeah. JSON. Yeah. Everybody remember what interface uh, this means? Yeah. What's uh, interface, curly brace, curly brace mean? Empty interface. It means the empty interface. The empty interface means it has no methods. And so any type implements the empty interface because any type has at least zero methods. So uh, that means anything. It means you can pass anything. I can pass a string, I can pass an object. And what it's going to do is it's going to JSON encode whenever I hand it. So if I handed it true, it would pop out true on the other end. If I handed a string, like message, it will wrap it in quotes and send that out. If I handed it uh, a slice, it'll make a JavaScript array. If I handed it an a map, it'll create a JavaScript object, and so on. Um, if I handed it a struct, it will also create a JavaScript object. Um, and so we could do, you know, just to see that, I, I could create a type, give it a struct, and it might have text, string, and, well, that would be capital T. Uh, I don't know, time. So I have my message, and I could, instead of doing this rec form value, I could create it and give it time and then send that through. But the point is you can send it. We're just going to send text. Just the message you passed in. Okay. So we're just sending in the message from the form, save it as a variable, pass the variable to send JSON. That returns an error. <coughs> so I'm just going to copy what I did here. And then there's two things I'm missing. What am I missing? Let's ask the compiler. Another return after that? The compiler helps us. Undefined CTX. Oh, well that's easy. Got that. You need a return between 25 and 26? Well, 
well, we don't have to, but it'd be good to like actually send something back, you know. So I go to the slash send, and it just happens, and I get a blank page. Maybe I should say exactly. Return with nothing. Okay. And that for, for somebody who doesn't return anything, that's just finish the function. Yeah. Like a break for a loop, it's the same idea. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is a pattern that we generally use with the errors. So there's sort of two ways we could do this. We can do it this way. We could also have done this. Whoops, there we go. So the other alternative is yeah. handle the error else. Yeah. The problem with this is we typically want to do like maybe five things that all return errors. Now you're going to have the code way in here. Yeah. And it's really hard to track branches with its for the human being. It turns out it's actually really hard for the computer too, for whatever that's like. But uh, for the human mind, it's like I'm 18 levels in, what's going on, right? And so we, we are generally trying to use this uh, fail fast approach instead, right? Where it's like, do something, if that failed, return it. Now we move on, and you can reason a little easier, be like, okay, from here on I know that I have a channel, or I know that I have a file. Um, and you don't have to think about, am I, you know, at the third else or the fourth else? You don't have to think like that, okay? The IO write string there, does that, does that close the response? No. So, okay, so the IDP library if you're not debugging, I can feed those in anywhere, and you know, and then after I'm done oh. putting together the stuff. You mean I you? Can, yeah, I you can, could write it twice. You can do that. Right, right. And then after I'm done messing around with it, I can render a template. You know, I can put in code to do the real stuff, but I can tag those in anywhere while I'm scouting. Like yeah, this. yeah. If you remove them eventually. Yeah. Yeah. I. I wasn't here when you went over the, you know, the handle, the handlers, so I don't know a good way to prototype it quickly, and that's obviously it. Yeah, or uh, format uh, f print, we use that a lot. Yeah? Yeah, so as long as you put the, the handle that you're writing to, or the, the stringer that you're writing to, not stringer, the writer that you're writing to, then you can use most of those. Uh, just checking my understanding of something. So line 25, the IO package has a method write string that takes a writer and then just some text. That's yeah. how you can read that. Yeah. I, I saw you also use uh, response.write on one of them. Yeah. But then like I also saw you use instead of IO uh, write string, I saw you use just the very beginning. Just the res dot write. Yeah, yeah. So response writer has a, a, a right. method write which just takes, I think, a string. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it takes a slice of bytes. So. Oh, uh, takes slice of bytes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You can do. Cool. Okay. What's the difference between these two? Well, we can go look at the definition for write string, and you can see what the difference is. Yeah. Well, one, it takes a string, but it, it is doing exactly the same thing. Except if it implements the string writer interface. And then it writes the string directly. So the downside of doing this is it copies the data. So I have a string, say it's a thousand characters long, and then I try to write it, it creates a copy as a byte slice. So now I have another thousand character string. But now it's bytes instead of a string. And then it writes it. So if the writer implements the screen writer interface, then it just writes it directly. It doesn't have to do the copy, and that's a little more efficient. But anyway, I, the reason I use it is because I think it's easier to understand yeah. this than it is to understand that. Yeah. Because 
what is this doing? Oh, I'm writing. And then you're like, wait, oh, I have to convert it into a byte slice. This is like, what is it doing? Oh, I'm writing a string to this. Yeah, okay, that's all. No real difference, though. So. There was a question? Another question? No, no question.